my gapes. Speaker, um, it is, as always, a great pleasure to follow the Right Honourable Member for Tunbridge and Morling. Um, he will recall that I, as a newly elected member of this House, joined him on the Foreign Affairs Committee in 1992. <coughs> and I can uh, remember uh, many visits in my time as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee to many different countries over the years, uh, where we, we might have had some issues about who we were able to meet, uh, we might have had some issues about the exact timings of visits, but never, ever, whether in Russia, whether in Iran, whether in Saudi Arabia, whether in Pakistan, whether in Afghanistan, or indeed in China, were we ever told you are not welcome to come and we will stop you or prevent you getting off the aircraft. And it's not, some members have referred to the question of visas, it's not a question of visas. UK citizens do not need visas to go to Hong Kong. The Hong Kong government determines its own internal arrangements. Yet, we have the people in Beijing and their diplomatic representatives in London telling us that we are not welcome in Hong, in Hong Kong. And that is clearly a breach, as the chairman uh, of the committee so ably put it, a breach of the undertakings given by the Chinese to the people of Hong Kong and to our representatives in the negotiations that led to the joint declaration. And I have to say, uh, it's been said that um, why um, are they doing this? I suspect, and it really surprises me, they must be afraid that the presence of a handful of British parliamentarians is somehow going to change the internal dynamics in Hong Kong and China. They must be very, very nervous and very worried. What's happening in Hong Kong is not being broadcast in Chinese media. You can see it covered in the rest of the world, you can see it in Taiwan. But the Chinese authorities have rigorously censored communications that, about events in Hong Kong. Just as when the people of Hong Kong protest on the anniversary of the massacre in Tiananmen Square, not a word of it is broadcast by the Chinese state authorities. This is an indication of the Chinese regime being prepared to use ruthless power because they are afraid. And I think it augurs very badly for what might happen in Hong Kong in coming weeks and months. I don't wish to spend too long talking about that, but I did want to talk about the issues related to Parliament and the committee's uh, inquiry. I go back to the previous time we visited China. In fact, in May 2006, the last Parliament's Foreign Affairs Select Committee, which I had the great honour to chair, we went to Hong Kong, and then we went from there to Beijing, and then the group split into two. One group went to Tibet, to Lhasa, another group, which I led, went to Shanghai. And then we met up again in Hong Kong and went to Taiwan. And one of the interesting episodes, and the uh, Right Honourable Member has just referred to it, was the meeting we had with the Foreign Minister Li Xiaojing, who was very pleasant to begin with, asked me um, how Margaret Beckett, sorry, the member for uh, Derby was, as the Foreign Secretary South, South thank you Mr <laughs> Speaker, uh, was, was how she was doing because he'd had discussions, amicable discussions with her in the United Nations, in the Security Council meetings. And then, after ten minutes, switched completely to tell us, I understand that you intend to go to our 19th province, <laughs> Taiwan. Uh, we have no objection to you going to our, your, our 19th province, but after the reunification of our country. <laughs> and then he said, 
you are all diplomats. And we said, no, no, we are parliamentarians. You don't understand. We are not here representing the British government. We are doing an inquiry. <coughs> and our presence and our visit will not in any way change the British government's policy. We are doing it because we need to investigate the issue of Taiwan and its relationship with China. And he said, if you do this, there will be serious consequences. So we wondered what those serious consequences were. But actually, as the right honourable member said, the visit continued. We went to Tibet, we went to Shanghai, we went back, then we went to Taiwan. And for the Foreign Affairs Committee, there were no serious consequences. Later on in the last parliament, we decided as a committee, when we were looking at human rights issues globally, to receive the Dalai Lama and have a public evidence session, which I chaired, with the Dalai Lama. At that point, I received a very long, vitriolic letter from the National People's Congress uh, in, in Beijing, and a visit from the then Chinese ambassador, uh, who subsequently became a, a deputy foreign minister, containing further, bringing lots of different materials, including piles of books about the CIA's role in Tibet and various other documentation. The Chinese obviously are very sensitive. They always have been. They've always been concerned about issues to do with their status and the respect that others will have for China in the world. And we can have a robust exchange about issues of this kind. But never, ever, has there been a ban on parliamentarians going from this House as a result of those differences? So this tells me that there is something happening internally in China which is worrying to me about this situation. In our report, in the, after uh, we did the inquiry in the last Parliament, um, we commented on the situation in Hong Kong. And at that time, we, in one of our conclusions, recommended that the government urge the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region to make significant, major steps towards representative democracy and to agree with Beijing a timetable by which direct election of the Chief Executive and LegCo by universal suffrage will be achieved. That, I hope, is a position which all of us, including members of the government and opposition front benches, could agree to today. It is, of course, a matter for the people of Hong Kong and China in the arrangements that have been set out under the uh, basic law to come forward with proposals. But nevertheless, the aspiration for representative democracy and universal suffrage is one that should apply for all people as soon as possible, including in Hong Kong. We also commented on the internal situation in Hong Kong with regards to civil liberties, humanitarian issues, the rule of law. And our conclusion in 2006 was, at that time, that despite some concerns, overall Hong Kong remains a vibrant, dynamic, open and liberal society with a generally free press and an independent judiciary subject to the rule of law. I hope that we can say the same about Hong Kong today. Obviously our report will have to be published in due course when we have finished our evidence. But I think the behaviour of the Chinese authorities towards our committee, as well as other issues that have been raised with us so far in the evidence that we've already received, does raise a concern about whether those principles and those values are under threat today. I want to just conclude by making a more general point, and the reference has been made to it in passing. Some people believe that we should just turn a blind eye 
to this. Some people believe that the economic imperative should determine everything. But those of us that have been to Taiwan, those of us that have been to other countries around the world with significant Chinese populations, know that there is nothing inherently authoritarian, Stalinist, Leninist, or Maoist in the Chinese character. And what is it that is communist about China today? Only the name of its ruling party. You have a capitalist, state capitalist economic system which is run by an elite who basically hold political power through a one-party system and suppress and control dissent. Now, how sustainable is that for the future? I don't know. China's economy is turning down at this moment. The rate of growth is slowing. They have a major demographic problem long term and China's ability to meet aspirations of its people, which it has done, it's taken hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in recent years, is not necessarily sustainable indefinitely with its current political model. So clearly, there are big questions for the rest of the world about how we deal with a growing China. People talked about China's rise. And there is the author who is very well informed, although I don't agree with his... I think rose-tinted conclusions, Martin Jakes, who wrote a book, uh, When China Rules the World. Well, frankly, if China was to become the most important country in the world politically, that would raise very, very serious issues about what kind of universal values we would have, what kind of rule of law, what kind of humanitarian law there would be. And so I think there are issues that it may be a small point for some people that a committee of the House of Commons has been prevented from going to Hong Kong. But actually it raises fundamental questions. Yes, of course. I thank the Honourable Man for giving way. Um, and does he not agree that this visit that has been banned is indeed symptomatic of China's attitude to the rest of the world, and particularly her near neighbours. If you consider the aggression over the uh, Senkaku Islands, uh, the adventurism in the South China Sea, the intransigence on the Security Council that, uh, that she has um, demonstrated. There are, I would be fairer to China. On some issues internationally, China has actually played a positive role. Uh, for example, on climate change issues and certainly on some other matters of international security. I don't think it's all on the bad side, but there are concerns about the attitude that they have and there are, as she has quite rightly highlighted, a number of territorial disputes around the coasts in, the, in, in, in East Asia where a number of states... Um, are in contention for potential areas of gas and oil exploration and, and, and territory. But I don't want to go down that track now. I just want to conclude with, with talking about the issue of democracy. In our report in 2006, we came to a very important conclusion, and we were commenting on the point then about the Chinese military build-up um, across the Taiwan Straits and the possible threat of peace to peace and stability in East Asia. Since then, relations between Taiwan and China have improved significantly. There are far more direct flights, there's a massive investment, there are millions of Chinese mainland tourists who go to Taiwan. As I saw last year, when I, over the new year, I was in Taiwan and the hotel I was in was full of mainland Chinese. And, but nevertheless, there is still a great sensitivity in China about Taiwan and what is happening there. And the Taiwanese people, and they have shown it in local elections recently, are very committed to democracy. They throw people out. They, 
reject incumbent parties and governments on a regular basis. And we concluded in 2006, and I think it is pertinent still today, it is relevant, the growth and development of democracy in Taiwan is of the greatest importance both for the island itself and for the population of Greater China, since it demonstrates incontrovertibly that Chinese people can develop democratic institutions and thrive under them. And that is also relevant for Hong Kong. And that is why what is going on in Hong Kong today matters, and it is why our committee is absolutely right to continue its inquiry, and in due course we will produce a report which the government will have to respond to, I hope, before the next election, um, so that we can have a further debate in this House about developments in Hong Kong and China uh, over coming months.